Men that hold office for long become detached from their constituents. Robert Yates. And this is a quote by Thomas Paine. There are, however, some things deducible from reason and evidenced by experience that serve to guide our decision upon the case. The one is never to invest any individual with extraordinary power. For besides his being tempted to misuse it, it will excite contention and commotion in the nation for the office. Secondly, never to invest power long in the hands of any number of individuals. The inconveniences that may be supposed to accompany frequent changes are less to be feared than the danger that arises from long continuance. And that, as I said, was Thomas Paine, Dissertation on First Principles of Government, 1795. Advocates of Republican systems long have insisted on certain features in a government to qualify it as a republic. Among those are the right to vote vested in a variable yet sufficiently substantial portion of adult residents, the election of the important figures in government, regular elections, short terms for those elected, rotation in office through restrictions on re-election, and the right of voters to recall elected officials. The objectives of these conditions are to keep the governing members responsive to the people's wishes, to promote fresh blood in positions of authority, and to allow more persons to participate in governing, thereby bestowing legitimacy on the system, even in the eyes of those who may lose a particular political contest. The opponents of the United States Constitution found much to criticize in what they saw as the deficient republicanism of the proposed charter. Colonial practice had been annual or even semi-annual terms for legislatures. Early state practice generally continued that tradition, although some permitted longer terms for the upper house of a bicameral legislature. Annual or biennial terms became the norm for governors. For example, the Massachusetts Constitution of 1780 provided that the governor, lieutenant governor, and senators and representatives in the state legislature may be elected annually. The Virginia Constitution of 1776 provided for annual election of the House of Delegates, the lower house of the state legislature, but allowed four-year terms for state senators, the terms ending on a rotating basis with one quarter of Senate offices up for election each year. The governor was elected annually. He could be re-elected for three terms, but then became ineligible for re-election for at least four years. At the level of the national government, the Articles of Confederation left the precise mode of choosing delegates to the states, but limited their terms in Congress to three years in six. Virginia, for example, chose its delegates to the Confederation Congress anew annually. The Northwest Ordinance of 1787, enacted by the Confederation Congress to govern the old Northwest Territory, also required annual election to the territorial legislature. It is today taken for granted that only citizens might vote, but that was not always the American practice. The Constitution requires citizenship for those elected to either House of Congress and to the presidency. But there is no similar qualification required for those doing the electing. The Constitution left it to the states to sort out. The Massachusetts Constitution of 1780, for example, discussed voting by inhabitants and imposed age, residency, and property qualifications, but not separate citizenship. Nor was there a lack of awareness of the concept of citizenship versus residency. The Northwest Ordinance provided that voting for territorial representatives was open to two classes. Those who were citizens of other states had resided in the territory for one year and owned a specified amount of property, and those who were not citizens but had resided in the territory for three years and owned the same specified amount of property. The ordinance made a similar distinction between citizens and non-citizens for candidates for election to the territorial legislature. 
States generally allowed non-citizens to vote well into the 19th century to attract immigrants. It is a common trope in historical accounts to write about urban political machines whose operatives at election time waited at the docks to welcome those fresh off the ships from Europe with job opportunities, a small gift, and a voting card filled out in favor of their benefactors. At the level of presidential elections, it was not until the election of 1928 that all states restricted voting to American citizens. Even today, about a dozen municipalities, mostly in Maryland, allow non-citizens to vote in local elections. While there was no significant debate about citizenship for voting, the length of terms of office was a matter of significant contention at the Convention in Philadelphia and in the state ratifying conventions. The Constitution supporters tried different approaches to blunt attacks. One was to cherry pick the length of terms of particular state offices or offices in Great Britain. As to the two-year terms of the House of Representatives, James Madison and number 53 of the Federalists agreed that there must be frequent elections, but quote, what particular degree of frequency may be absolutely necessary for the purpose does not appear to be susceptible of any precise calculation, end quote. Thus, a range of terms of service reasonably would be sufficiently Republican. To illustrate his point, Madison contrasted the terms of the lower houses of various state legislatures. Quote, in Connecticut and Rhode Island, the periods are half yearly. In the other states, South Carolina accepted, they are annual. In South Carolina, they are biennial, as is proposed in the federal government. Here is the difference as four to one between the longest and the shortest periods, and yet it would be not easy to show that Connecticut or Rhode Island is better governed or enjoys a greater share of rational liberty than South Carolina, end quote. If anything, shorter terms were undesirable and that they encouraged electoral fraud, a concern not unheard of today. Quote, spurious elections cannot be investigated and annulled in time for the decision to have its due effect. Hence, a very pernicious encouragement is given to the use of unlawful means for obtaining irregular terms, end quote. It might be added that representatives complain that, even with modern transportation, two-year terms are burdensome because they need to spend so much time campaigning for re-election. It should be noted that these complaints have increased as the members of Congress have become full-time legislatures and the size of the government has expanded. Even if long terms of office might be undesirable as a matter of general consideration, there might be more justification for a longer term in Congress than in state or local legislative councils. National affairs regulated by Congress require greater acquisition of knowledge of complex policies and of the needs of other states. Hence, more time is needed to become sufficiently familiar with these complexities, whereas in a state, the laws are uniform and the people and their needs are less diversified. In the end, Madison argued, quote, The business of federal legislation must continue so far to exceed, both in novelty and difficulty, the legislative business of a single state as to justify the longer period of service assigned to those who are to transact it. End quote. The six-year terms for senators came in for especially harsh criticism. Madison and other Federalists frequently defended the Senate's long terms on two grounds. The need for stabilizing influence over the popular passions likely to influence the short-term focus of the more democratic House of Representatives and the state's role in the potentially complex matters of foreign relations. After a brief attempt to analogize the terms of office of United States Senators to the five-year terms of Senators in the state of Maryland, Madison in essay number 63 of the Federalist emphasized the role of the Senate as a stabilizing influence on the House of Representatives, both by taking a, quote, longer, end quote, view on policy 
and because of the, quote, propensity of all single and numerous assemblies to yield to the impulse of sudden and violent passions and to be seduced by factious leaders into intemperate and pernicious resolutions, end quote. As well, there was the Senate's function in foreign affairs, which required sophistication, wisdom, and knowledge. Moreover, Longer terms gave that body the stability to provide a, quote, national character, end quote, needed for the United States to be effective in dealing with foreign nations. The critics were not convinced. Even moderate opponents saw the Senate's terms as dangerous. In Essays of Brutus, number 16, of April 10, 1788, the New Yorker Robert Yates agreed that the Senate's stabilizing role and its tasks in foreign affairs required longer terms than those of the typical state legislature or of the House of Representatives. Yates also agreed that the Senate was to represent the country's, quote, natural, end quote, aristocracy. But the danger to republicanism remained, quote, men that hold office for long become detached from their constituents, end quote. This is especially a problem with the Senate as, quote, they will for the most part of the time be absent from the state they represent and associate with such company as will possess very little of the feelings of the middling class of people. For it is to be remembered that there is to be a federal city and the inhabitants of it will be the great and the mighty of the earth, end quote. The solution for Yates and for his fellow New York anti-federalist Melanchthon Smith, writing as the Federalist Farmer, was to reduce the term to four years. In addition, there must be rotation in office. Yates proposed a limit of three terms for senators and recall as existed in the Articles of Confederation. Otherwise, the reality will be that senators will be reelected over and over for life due to the influence of their friends. Quote, everybody acquainted with public affairs knows how difficult it is to remove from office a person who has long been in it. It is seldom done except in cases of gross misconduct. It is rare that want of competent ability procures it, end quote. The concerns of the Constitution's critics found their way into proposals for reform even as the states approved the new plan of government. Among the list of proposed amendments from the Virginia Convention sent on June 27, 1788, was one that called for rotation in office as a very useful tool to limit the potential threat to the people's liberty from an entrenched political class, so that members of legislative and executive branches, quote, may be restrained from oppression by feeling and participating the public burdens, they should at fixed periods be reduced to a private station, return into the mass of the people and the vacancies be supplied by certain and regular elections, end quote. None of the proposals have been adopted. Senate terms are still six years. There is no rotation in office, and an attempt by the people of Arkansas to provide, quote, term limits, end quote, for members of both houses of Congress elected in Arkansas was struck down as unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court. Likewise, an attempt by people in New Jersey even to collect signatures to allow a recall vote for a senator was blocked by the state Supreme Court as unconstitutional. Meanwhile, members of Congress, especially senators, generally hold office for decades, often until death. It is common for them to be, quote, absent from the state they represent, end quote. They live in the, quote, federal city, end quote, returning to their states only at election time. The environs of the District of Columbia include the wealthiest areas of the United States, so it may also be rightly said that they associate with the, quote, great and mighty of the earth, end quote, who, quote, possess very little of the feelings of the middling class of people, end quote. This essay was written by Yor W. Niprath, and he is an expert on constitutional law and member of the Southwestern Law School faculty, and he is a Constituting America fellow. I am Janine Turner, founder of Constituting America. 
I am Kathy Gillespie, Constituting America's CEO. Thank you for joining us for our 13th annual 90-day study. Our annual studies are entitled 90 plus 90 equals 180. History holds the key to the future because history does hold the key to the future. Or as Shakespeare said, the past is prologue. Join us tomorrow. Right back here, same Bat Channel, same Bat Time, for those of you who are as old as I and watch Batman, the TV show. Don't forget to check out our essays on American exceptionalism. It's our study from last year. If you go to the constitutionamerica.org and scroll down, you'll see the studies, and you'll see a little red button that says American exceptionalism study. Really good so that we have 90 days of 90 tools in our toolbox so that we can have a really good civil civic conversation about why America is exceptional. Have a great day. We thank Amanda Hughes for championing these wonderful studies and for Bobby Rodriguez for editing these wonderful essays and sending them out there into the universe. Have a wonderful day.